Alrighty, I think we have most people in from the waiting room. Okay. So I will go ahead and get us started. My name is Jessica. I'm coming to you live from Brookings, South Dakota, and I would like to welcome everyone on behalf of the South Dakota Humanities Council, which produces the annual Festival of Books. We're so pleased to have you at our 2021 virtual event. We would like to acknowledge first and foremost that this program comes to you from ground, which is the homeland of the Ocheti, uh, Shakoween, the Lakota, Dakota, and Nakota people. The South Dakota Humanities Council honors and appreciates the indigenous people who have the longest relationship to this place. And before this event gets underway, I'd like to share some housekeeping details. We ask that you keep your microphone muted throughout the event to minimize background noise. And if you would like to ask questions or share comments with today's presenter, please type them in the chat section on Zoom, which you can open by clicking the conversation bubble at the bottom of your screen. You can also enter comments um, in the comment section on Facebook. And uh, I will pass along as many questions and comments as possible at the end of the session. And if you um, wish, and if we have time, we will also ask you to unmute at the end of the session so that you can ask your questions directly. We encourage you to buy books by our presenting authors at your local independent bookstore. Our official festival book sellers are Books A Million and the Birdcage Bookstore in Mercantile, both in Rapid City. <clears throat> you can also buy directly from authors and publishers. I will be posting those links in the chat as we get started with our presentation. To help us continue to improve the festival, we would be much obliged if you would fill out our evaluation form. I'll share a link with that in the chat as well, and then we will email you a link to this survey at the end of the festival. Finally, you can help keep the festival free by making a tax deductible donation to the South Dakota Humanities Council. Simply visit our website, sdhumanities.org, and click the donate button, or text the word Festival 21 to 707070. <clears throat> of course, the festival would not be possible without the generous support of the numerous organizations and individuals who have already donated and are acknowledged on the back cover of our festival guide, as well as on the Humanities Council's website. Now on with the show. Today's program is called Out of Loneliness, Murder and Misunderstanding in South Dakota with Mary Wooster Howe. Mary is the author of Out of Loneliness, Murder and Memoir, and Daughters of the Grasslands. She has been published in several anthologies and journals, as well as editing a collection of her brother's columns entitled The Wooster Brothers ba Brand, Episodes of a Shared Inheritance. Haug has been twice nominated for a Pushcart Prize and is a recipient of the Spirit of Dakota Award. She currently lives in Minneapolis. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to you, Mary. Welcome. Thank, thank you, Jessica. And thank you to the South Dakota Humanities Council and to my beautiful, talented niece, Jennifer Wooster Widman, who puts together the book festival. Um, I would also like to thank anybody out there in cyberspace. I only see a couple live faces, so I'll probably be focusing on your eyes as I talk because I need to see people in order to feel like I'm engaging with someone. Uh, I, I'll mention a couple of other things. The, the book was published by the Humble Essayist Press in Blairsville, Georgia, and it's a literary press recently founded by three um, people who have dedicated their careers to teaching and writing creative nonfiction. Those are um, Robert Root, who actually edited my, my manuscript, Stephen Harvey, and Catherine Winograd. Um, and I very much appreciate the opportunity they've given me to get this book. Um, I wanna say something about the cover, and then I can explain the cover a little bit later, but Taylor Livingston of Upframe Creative in Brookings, South Dakota did the cover. Uh, she was quite pregnant when I called her about it, but she did it anyway. So I just think the cover is kind of slap, you know, a little bit, Oh, too shiny. But I thought she knocked it out of the ballpark. All right, so this book um, began, I suppose, in 1962 when a woman named Bev Waugh uh, rammed into the car driven by a young Lakota man named Myron Menzi. Um, 
and got out and walked over to the car and eventually shot him, killed him. And sitting in the front seat was Menzies, Myron Menzies' fiance, a teenage girl, Gina Lee, who was also at the same time having an affair with Bev. So it was a fairly shocking <laughs> murder in Chamberlain, South Dakota in 1962, it was pretty uncommon anyway. And then add the element of a romance that an inverted kind of love triangle that none of us really understood, add that. And um, so it was always, and I remember that, it was always in the back of my mind, but I didn't, I didn't think, I obviously didn't think I'd be writing a book about it. But I'll read you a little bit of how this started. I'll read this, it's from the first chapter in the um, book. I'm, I went on my way to the courthouse to get the trial transcripts. A picture of Bev Waugh on the front page of a yellowed newspaper prompted my journey to this modest courthouse of blonde bricks and black trim. The photo captured the image of a woman with delicate features, the contours of her face soft, her skin unblemished, shoulders and waist narrow. My tiny one, Gina called her, referring to her size six boots and diminutive frame. My words for Bev were brawny, fierce, and masculine, a maverick in cowboy boots and Western shirt. Seeing Bev's photo prompted feelings of fear mixed with confusion. How could I reconcile my memories with this tiny woman in the photo? A woman my cousin Leo described as having the potential to be drop dead beautiful, a real knockout. Perhaps what matters most is not my faulty recollections, but the reasons for my distortion of her. Why? That's a question I needed to ask, the itch I needed to scratch. I discovered the paper on a steamy July day in 1999 while cleaning out my mother's home in Chamberlain following her move to an assisted living facility. The air conditioner had been turned off and the heat and the dust and the carpet and the drapes triggered a migraine. I soaked a piece of paper towel, pressed it to my forehead and collapsed on the worn carpet in the living room surrounded by garbage bags filled with magazines, tattered linens and dish rags, out of date calendars and cookbooks. My brothers had already loaded trucks with furniture, including my mother's upright piano and Wurlitzer organ, the two material possessions that most defined her. As I watched them drive away, I felt utterly alone. I had never been in this house without hearing my mother play ragtime on a piano. Now all that could be heard was the wailing of the wind, nature's muted saxophone blowing against the window screens. At the end of the day, what remained was silence and a withered balloon dangling from the ceiling. The word grandmother collapsed in wrinkles of, of latex. My mother had tucked the newspaper with Bev's photo and a stack of magazines piled in the corner of our front porch. Why? Mother took little pride in the tidy house, so she may have misplaced it in the room's clutter. More likely she hid it during the trial because the story reveals sexual details too salacious for her children to read. I sometimes imagine my Irish Catholic mother creeping into the room after her children had gone to bed and reading of a sexual expression that I assume shocked her. Years later, I learned that a lesbian couple was among mother's friends. So it's possible she was curious about the desire that these two women felt for one another, but not judgmental. It's their business, not mine, she said. And I should add, I found this after the fact, after the book had gone to print, that she said to my sister Jeannie, one of the women was married, and she said to my sister Jeannie, well, you know, her husband was kind of a dud anyway. So I wish I had that line, <laughs> but I don't. It's um, that comment further complicated a woman who often surprised and confused me. I sorted through a lifetime of her possessions with an archeologist's eye for, um, for, art for revelatory artifacts that were significant artifacts. Despite my search, my mother remained an enigma or a cone, a paradoxical riddle that, riddle that Zen Buddhists use to unravel meaning from contradictions. Above me, dust motes shimmered as they swirled in the sunlight streaming through the windows. Questions spiraled through my brain in the same way. Most of my memories involved the shock of an inverted love affair that led to violence. How could I have known or thought so little about the love story behind it? I had never imagined a conversation between the women. Was it possible that lesbians might flirt and date the way that normal people do? Another question, how was it that Gina, an attractive honor student, cheerleader and teacher's pet, 
could be in a relationship with Beth, an awkward loner who flunked a grade, who after eighth grade turned 16 and dropped out of school. Thoughts of the mismatch between Bev and Gina brought to mind the novel, The Ballad of the Sad Cafe by Carson McCullers. She writes of a love triangle involving Miss Amelia, a tall, masculine and eccentric woman, her cousin Lyman, a short humpback schemer, and her former husband and ex-con, Marvin Macy. The community regards the triangle the lovers have formed as grotesque in some way. Sometimes people consider the relationship between Bev and Gina to also be freakish. McCullers, however, doesn't try to make sense of or to judge their attraction. She simply accepts the incongruities and often pain of being in love. There are the lover and the beloved, she writes, but those two come from different countries. So when I, after, when I was done cleaning out mother's house, I took a few things for myself. And for some reason, uh, to this day, I don't know, I kept the newspaper. So there's Bev. Um, she's standing with a man named Samuel Masson. And if any of you are of my age <laughs> or older, you will have heard of Samuel Masson. He was a very famous uh, prosecutor in Lincoln County, County. He had a very successful career. I think the mock trials at the University of South Dakota are still named for him. Um, and he, be, he was asked to be Bev's defense attorney. So he took that on. Um, and so that's, that's the young man that's in the picture with him. Why I kept it, I'm just not sure. Um, but I did. And when I found, you know, about 20 years later, I guess, I decided to pull out the newspaper clipping, which was still in my desk drawer, and started thinking about this story. Um, Elizabeth Gilbert in Big Magic has a theory that there are ideas floating out there all around us, just waiting for someone to grab on and take, do something with it. <laughs> and it's not, there's no explanation for why all of a sudden this came to me, except it's big magic. And that I would be was just waiting for the right person to grab it and write the story. So maybe I was the right person. I hope that's the case. Cause I tried to be, I tried to handle this story very carefully. Um, in addition, well, I'll back up. So after I cleaned out my mother's house, I came back a week or so later and um, went to the courthouse and asked for, no, several years later, I'm sorry, asked for the uh, copies of the transcript and uh, there was an appeal case. So there's two different trials that she was involved in. And the woman said that she'd never heard of that. And she said, if that's 1962, I, I suspect that we won't have it anymore. And I thought, oh, wow, well, there, you know, that's gone. But she said she'd check. Well, she came back with a flash drive and the transcripts for both um, the first, the original trial and the appeal trial were on that flash drive. And also it contained the letters that the women had written to one another. And, and I was just stunned to find those letters. I, I could not believe it. And I, I consider them a gift and a burden because on the one hand, it opened me into their lives in a way that no, nothing else could, right? These are their words. They're writing to each other in their own words. They're talking about their feelings and what they're doing together. But now I have this responsibility that, uh, you know, the invasion of privacy, if you will. I thought a lot about that. But I knew if I was going to write this book, I wanted to have it be in their words as much as possible. I did interviews. I interviewed Jeff Maston, who's the defense attorney. Um, who the son of the defense attorney, who he's the one that told me, he was about 14, I think, when his father was defending her. And he's the one that told me that she would wear her bra backwards to flatten her breasts. And then she rolled up a sock and put it in the front of her jeans. And he, he kind of, he stayed in touch with her for a number of years. Um, I talked to the, the, the son of H.L. Holman, who was the state's attorney who prosecuted the case. I talked to a lot of people in the community and my family, many of whom remember it. I visited with uh, Renee Baker, a transgender woman in, in Texas, and Renee was incredibly helpful. I did newspapers, a lot of personal experience. I went back to Chamberlain often, and I would just stand on Sanborn Street where the murder occurred, or on the River Bluff or outside my house, just, just to see if it would spark something. And, and, and I, a lot of memories came, came that way. And I spent a lot of time at the Rainbow Cafe too, sitting by the 
window overlooking Main Street and working with my notes and things, just because that really did bring back some memories. And then I read a lot of books. I read a lot of books about um, true crime memoirs. I read a lot of books about true crime. I read a lot of books about um, um, LBGTQ issues. Um, and I actually then went off onto other journeys. I discovered that when Bev was convicted in the first trial, she was sent to the York Women's Prison in Nebraska. At the same time, Carol Ann Fugit was there. And I don't know if any of you remember that case, but that was a Charles Starkweather, Starkweather movie where this teenage girl went across the state of Nebraska. I think they killed 10 or 12 people in that week or something. They were in prison at the same time. So I found a copy of a book about her and found out that she had the same challenges with the legal system that Bev had. And a lot of it had to do with disadvantaged, disenfranchised young women who, who had no chance, just no chance. And uh, their stories were very similar. In the process of writing, I had to make a lot of decisions. And I worked with um, a couple of really incredible young women, Christine Stewart and Amber Jensen, who worked me through a lot of this book over and over and over again. It helped me process some of the things. One of the things I, I wasn't sure I wanted to do was to write it as a memoir because I thought if I write it as fiction, then I have no, <laughs> I can hide behind the fiction. I don't have to um, confront the possibility of hurting a family member's feelings. And at the same time, and as Christine pointed out, you know, I just sort of had an obligation to tell it from my point of view. And, you know, she always says to me, Christine always said, if, if you want other people to share their stories, you have to share your stories. And that's so fair. It makes me mad that she said that to me sometimes, but I think she's absolutely right. You do have to. And also, I thought it was more authentic. I, I, I'm not a member of the community. I don't know what it's like to be a transgender person or LBG or bisexual. Um, I don't understand those. I, I've not lived that experience. And I didn't want any sense that I was appropriating that story. I wanted to tell it in a way that um, sort of made me the, own the story and showing how their story altered me, how the learning about them changed who I was in many ways, or at least what I knew about the world. Um, so that was a big debate for me, but I, I went with memoir. And, um, <laughs> and I ended up writing about things that I hadn't thought about. It never dawned on me I would write a chapter about menstruation, but that's one of those things that just grew organically out of, out of thinking about what it means to be a transgender, man, um, Bev had to go through puberty. She developed breasts. She menstruated. What? But she identified being male. What did the, I hated menstruating when I started. I thought it was a horrible process. And I kept asking, well, what is it like if you think you're a man? What if it's like, you know, what would it be like for her? And so then I, I just thought, well, you better write about this, which I did, which led me to Anne Frank. And so I had to read another book with some things about Anne Frank. Um, I debated a lot about names. And in most cases, I use real names. I did change. There's uh, the young teenage girl is still alive. I changed her name and the name of all her family members. Um, I, I just felt I really, really like her and I wanted to uh, protect her privacy as best I could. That was one reason. Another reason is I wrote what I thought was a sweet little story about my mother's kitchen band was published in um, the SDSU literary magazine, Oakwood. <laughs> and I wrote about, I included the two women that were in a relationship. And apparently someone got a hold of it and ended up sending a letter to Barry Dunn and to me, Barry Dunn is the president of SDSU, accusing me of being cruel and unkind and vicious and not appreciating my mother. and spreading terrible stories about people. And I thought, oh, I don't want to go through that again. So I'm just going to change those names. So I changed some names. I also collapsed some characters, two or three young women friends into one person and into one setting just to make the story um, more concise and, and clearer. Um, narrative structure is always my, my bugaboo. I have the worst time figuring out how to structure a book. But eventually I think I figured out with chronological 
you know, telling it in a chronological order, but shifting back and forth in time as I do that story. So I don't know, if you read it, you'll have to tell me if it worked. I don't know if it did or not, but that's how I went with that. Um, it's also creative nonfiction and, or literary nonfiction. And that's a, a creative nonfiction is a term that, oh, a lot of people will laugh and say, well, then it's a lie, isn't it? Or it's fiction, isn't it? What do you mean creative? It's, if it's fiction, it's a lie. But that's not what that means. It means using the strategies of fiction to tell a true story, basically. That's my definition of it. Um, so everything, every event happened. It either happened in my life or it happened in the lives of the three characters. And I know that because of the transcripts. And I know that because of the letters that they wrote. So all the events are true. Every word spoken by uh, the characters other than myself and my family came directly from the letters or the trial transcripts. So all of the dialogue spoken by Bev and Gina and uh, um, their parents and the attorneys, all of that is taken verbatim from um, the copies, I, the information I got from the courthouse. So that's all very true. The dialogue that, my, you know, that I write in my own life is I tried to be as true as I could um, to the way that the people of my time and place talked, but of course some of that's invented, right? Because I don't have a written document of, of the way that they talk, but I do have you know, 70 years of listening to it. So that helps a little bit that I'm sort of able to duplicate that. 70 plus years. <clears throat> so where I move into probably creative fiction and where you can perhaps take issue with some of my work is, let me think of an example. If I'm talking about Bev and Gina parking on Lover's Point, this pasture outside of Pakwana, um, I can rely on having been there. I wasn't necking, I'm sure, but I can rely on having been there. I can remember seeing Puck Juan in the distance. I, I can remember what it felt like to be 16 and necking with a guy, right? And so I relied upon my own experience to uh, envelop the scene or develop the scene so that it sort of comes to life. And I would do that throughout. And I tried really hard to be as authentic as possible when I wrote about the Rainbow Cafe, which is now the Anchor Grill in Chamberlain. But when I wrote about the Rainbow Cafe and I described it, I thought, you know, I might be wrong. And so I started looking online and I found postcards and I was pretty right. <laughs> so I, I felt really pretty good that I came as close as I could. The other fun thing about that is I found a postcard at the Rainbow Cafe when I was in junior high, they would have sock hops in the back room with a jukebox. And I found a picture of my oldest brother, Jim, jitterbugging with a girl in a ponytail and saddle shoes. I mean, just right out of 1957. And, and so that was fun. I, I discovered some things I wasn't expecting. So those are the kinds of questions you have to ask yourself, I guess, when you're writing a memoir and writing a memoir about a true event. Um, yeah, and it, it, uh, it was very moving for me. Um, when I was 16 years old and I saw this woman who was so much strange. I mean, I, I knew ranch women, I knew farm women and they would wear jeans sometimes, but there was something different about Bev. Um, there was just an aura. She scared people and, and she was little, but I don't understand how she scared people. But I've said, my three brothers, well, I'll tell you, they were terrified of her. And I, I think to look at that story and realize what a tragic figure she was. Um, when she checked, when she was taken to Yankton after the murder, immediately after the murder for a, a psychiatric diagnostic test and so forth, her IQ measured 72 that day. It went up to 80 later, but because of stress, so she's, she's living in poverty. Um, her parents and her siblings, all, most of them struggle with various kinds of mental illness or alcoholism. Um, they're an outcast. And I just had never considered anything except that she was a scary person that I didn't understand. And um, it, was, it was quite a revelation for me to sort of put myself in 
to the life of a woman whose circumstances are so much different from mine, even though we were living at, at a very similar time in a very similar place. I think I said somewhere in the book, she had all of my yearnings, but none of my possibilities. And, you know, so a lot of the times I was quite um, heartbroken as I wrote this book. And the other thing that was a struggle, um, I, I, for me, I had a hard time deciding about the pronoun choice. Um, and when I was talking to Renee, who I first knew as Scott, I was very aware of using the pronoun she, um, and it was, it was very comfortable with that. And I understood the necessity and why it would be important for me to, to use that pronoun. But in 1962, no one used, there was no awareness of that. I mean, and everything uses she. The trial transcripts, the letters, Bev herself would have referred to herself as she. Um, so there was, I just decided I had to make a choice. I didn't want to clutter the writing with going back and forth between what, what would have been said in 1962 and what would have been said in 2017 or 2018 when I started writing this. Well, 2000, earlier than 2017. I was surprised too, because in another group I have up here in Minneapolis, one man said, well, why did you use the name Bev? Why didn't you use her masculine name? I said, she didn't have one. <laughs> she called herself Bev. There was no awareness of, uh, the psychiatrist had no awareness really of, of how to define Bev Law. Um, one psychiatrist called her a third sex, which is just an odd kind of, but she, there, was no, there was no one using a masculine name at that time. She did tell somebody that she was named Beverly because her parents wanted a girl and that her middle name was Charles. But that, was, that wasn't true. That just wasn't true. And I found other things she said in, during the course of the research that were still interesting little lies. One was that she was born in her car by the side of the road on her the way to the uh, Catholic hospital in Mitchell, South Dakota. That wasn't true. She was born at home and her grandmother midwifed her. I don't know why she, that was an important story for her to create, but the problem is it made her less credible. I mean, you know, the lawyers used those lies. The prosecuting attorney used those lies and um, made her look less credible. But she was maybe trying to create a new, a whole new identity. I don't know, because you know I can't ask her that. She died in 2019, maybe, before I could get a hold of her. Um, yeah, so there was a lot of things about doing this memoir that I didn't have to do with my first one because I was working with a very concrete story in terms of information being available and um, more complicated in that way, but very, very rewarding. And I think that, I hope that if the Gina person ever reads the book, that she sees how much I understood what it was like to be 16, 18, a teenager in 1962 with no access to information about sexuality, no under, nowhere. We couldn't go to a library. Our parents probably wouldn't talk about it. Um, the only sec access I had to sexuality was being lectured by the priest about premarital sex and whatever that was. I wasn't even sure at 16 how that worked, to be honest, I was so naive. And um, so I really identified with how confused this teenage girl must have been going through all this. And then to have it end in murder, I mean, it's just beyond, um, it's beyond comprehending how much this must have affected her and how hard it must have been for her for years after that, so. I'm trying to think, Does, I, I know only maybe one person on here has actually seen one version of the book. Does it, I'm open to questions or I can keep, I can find something else to read. Anybody have an idea? You can unmute or you can, are any questions coming in, Jessica? Excuse me, um, <clears throat> we don't have any questions or comments yet. Just a reminder, everyone, you can type those in the comments section here. You can type them in on Facebook, or um, we can also ask everyone to unmute themselves if they would rather ask uh, Mary directly. So we'll give everyone just a moment to gather some questions. 
And then you are, if you check your microphone now, you all should be able to <clears throat> um, unmute your microphone if you'd like to ask a question. Uh, I see Christine has her hand up. Yeah, I um, just want to- Hi, you. Hi. <laughs> come um, back. Oh, I'm coming up there. Forget come back. I'm moving to Winnipeg. There you go. <laughs> we, we have room. You're okay. always welcome. Um, so I'm just curious about kind of the book from from when we were working on it to where it's currently its current iteration and and kind of what you um, what working with your publishers, what what kind of editing they had for it and kind of what you think the um, what what time helped you develop with this over the last couple of years? Like what kind of, what were the bigger changes in it um, besides adding y your own like reflections and things mm -hmm. like that? So I was just curious, I'm gonna read it very soon. Okay. Well, you, <laughs> but you I just wanna know what I'm, I just wanna know what I'm gonna, what, what some of those differences yeah. are in your process, like how that sh shifted. I'm trying to remember when you, at what point you read I really took a lot of I, I did more speculating um, and more invention maybe in the trial and in other scenes and I pulled some of that out if I couldn't justify why I was describing the courtroom the way I did I pulled a lot of that out so I think I took um, I made it less fiction in that way I think I did some of that i as I was, like I mentioned, reading Anne Frank again and then reading this book about Caroline Fuga and reading the, the Battle of the Sad Cafe again. And some of those questions rose up, came up. I went back and read an, a, an original. So I added some of those. I, I know that I didn't have the Carson McCullers quote and I use her throughout the book um, because that, I could just see the parallel between the Battle of the Sad Cafe and, and this story and the Anne Frank as well. Um, so they, they are woven into the book in ways that I didn't do before. I really changed the end a lot from what you saw, I think. I knew, I knew the minute I wanted to write this book that I was going to write the story and open with Bev driving down the hill and close with me going up the hill at the end of the book. That's the only thing I knew I was going to do. And <laughs> I did do that. I, I did bring Bev down at the beginning and I left at the end. And um, I look in the, you know, and I see the sun setting behind me as I drive home. And, um, I'm trying to think what else. Robert Root, the editor, he pulled, um, he had me rearrange some things. He, I pulled some sections out of the end and tucked them in earlier. And then I took, if you remember the scene of where my, I'm with my girlfriends and we're driving down Maine and I pass her and she looks at me. And, and, and now I've gone through this girly transition. I've gone from being a tomboy because of after the murder that people were saying, Chamberlain's, Chamberlain, where men are men and so are women. So I decided I better look like a girl and I did this stupid transition. And I, I put that at the end because that's when I, I wanted to talk about how brave I realized she was to become a man despite all the circumstances and how cowardly I was to become more girly because of boys making fun of me. I, the fear of boys making fun of me. So the, I switched that around and I pulled out some other sections and I added the whole Carol Ann Fugit. That was fascinating um, to see the parallels between those two disenfranchised young women. Trying to think what else. Um, she, we, I tightened up sentences. Um, he mentioned that. Kent Myers read it. He gave me some great insights into keeping it closer to nonfiction than fiction and what, he, and, um, what I needed to do and to remember, and what I should have mentioned this earlier, when I'm speculating, I try to tell people I'm speculating. I maybe miss it a few times, but I use signal words like in my mind, or I wonder if, or if perhaps it's so, you know, I try to let people know, this is me wondering, this is not fact. And I did a lot more of that in, this, in later versions, I think, Christine. Um, I think it's, I think it improved, I hope, I hope. It was a it was a <laughs> group project, I can tell you, <laughs> as it always is, I guess. Mary, this is Mac Harris. Yes. Hi, Mary. Hi, Mac. How's it going? Good. 
Good to, good to hear this. This was very, very interesting and I enjoyed it. And I was, I was wondering, you know, growing up in a small town in Oklahoma, much like you grew up in a small town in mm -hmm. South Dakota, these are very similar experiences with uh, people who are different than you mm -hmm. are growing up. And, mm -hmm. and I wondered, I know you compared this uh, to other books or people that you, you found in your research. Mm -hmm. And how close in similarity did you come to finding some story in your research that would be compatible to these this incident in your your book does that make sense what i just yeah, well i yeah i i ran across because i would i did read true crime memoirs or true crime and especially if it involves um especially any story that involved violence at the end so there was there were a few i read and almost always it was violence toward a person who was gay or transgender that you know there's one called murder at, anyway it's a murder in junior high and this uh, this young seventh grade boy who's transitioning into a girl was murdered in the school was shot in the school by a classmate who thought he was hitting on her or hitting on him and I didn't find as many cases of a transgender man causing violence being violent and maybe they were there and I just didn't find them but I did find um, I did find similar stories of people struggling. I'm you know of uh, people who had violence committed toward them. I mean, obviously, what's the um, boys don't cry? I mean, that was one of the huge ones. And I did watch that movie again, and I did read read about that again. Um, but it was often not the person who was being discriminated against who caused the violence. It was the victim was the person who was being discriminated against. I mean, I'm sorry, they, it was not the victim that, or the person who was being discriminated against who did the violence. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I didn't mention too that I, I also veer off into looking at um, race because you can't really talk about this story in 1962 without talking about the effect that uh, Myron's race had on on um, people in the community and particularly on Bev who frequently talked about hating half-breeds and um, in her letters she makes a lot of threats about that half-breed. Her parent, her sister and mother were very shocked at that because she said there were a lot of young Indian women that came to play with you know when they, Bev was in high school and came down to the house. They, they didn't think she was um, biased against Native people, but she uses the language. And so I looked at, I just talked about, oh, one of the things I talked about a lot was interracial dating in 1962, which I would not have had the courage to do. <laughs> I just wouldn't have. And so I just thought it was incredibly brave of, of um, Gina to just go past that because, you know, there was an unwritten rule about interracial dating. And I I, I accepted the rule. Not proud of myself in this book a lot, Mac. <laughs> Not proud of who I was very often in this book. Well, I think that's that's true of a lot of us, Mary. I, I, I grew up in Oklahoma with a lot of Native American kids. And so interracial dating with Native Americans and, and Anglos were very common yeah. in a lot of marriage. So it wasn't unusual for me. So I, I find it somewhat unusual here in, in some of the reactions. And I that led me to my next and final question. Uh, have you considered doing anything about uh, Native American history and the relationship in your community or in your life or in the state of Native American relations? Are you talking about a book? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Long time to ask me. <laughs> I don't know. I don't, know that, be, years I don't know that I'd be qualified. Jessica, are we running out of time? Um, we're still up on time, but I just want to let you know I do have a few other okay. questions okay. whenever you're ready. I'm, that's fine. I can always talk from that. Okay. Uh, so a question from the audience. Uh, what can you tell us about 
the distribution and availability of this book? Okay, this book will be, it's, you can get it. What I would prefer is you can go to a local bookstore and this won't come out until October 27th. But I know that in Brookings, the art museum is planning to carry it. Um, I'm going to have it, I'm sure Zambros will carry it. I stopped there in Sioux Falls the other day. I stopped there and I'm sending books out to them as soon as they're available. Um, I'm assuming um, that Rapid City, the bookstore out there, the name is escaping me, that they probably will be getting this book as soon as it's available. Otherwise, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Powell's, Books a Million. It's on, it might be in the back of the book, but if they go online, go for sure Amazon, Powell, Barnes and Noble, and Books a Million, it's available. But if you live in Brookings, I, I know she ordered it, so. Okay, wonderful. And then a question, another question from the audience. What other faults did you find in your memories? Oh, <laughs> well, I'm trying to, I'm sure none, right? I'm sure none. I'm sure everything else I remembered. Um, I think I didn't. Oh, that's such a good question. I'm trying to think hard. It wasn't just that. I, I was so wrong about what she looked like. I, I was so wrong about it being a tragedy. I didn't see it as tragic. I didn't see it as comic, but we just thought, well, that's weird, you know, it's 16. And as I, I dug into this story, it became increasingly clear to me what a tragedy it was all the way around. I mean, there were three victims in this, there were three victims and in some ways, three perpetrators. So, um, I'm trying to think of, is that, by the way, one of my siblings? Because I think they're on and they probably want to take me on. Oh, uh, let's see. The question about false no, in your memory. That's came. fine. No, not a, that's fine. They didn't indicate a last no, name. I'm, I'm kidding about that. But I write in this, I write in the book about um, Jimmy Waugh, who was Bev's, one of her brothers, who he struggled with drinking and mental illness. He was, um, in and out of the state hospital in Yankton a couple of times. And he would fish under the river. And I think my brother was quite young when he'd go down there and fish with him. And he told the story about, uh, he had told me the story years ago about Jimmy popping an eye out of, I thought it was a carp. And then I found out that was the wrong fish and chewing on it. But then Kevin, this is Kevin, also told me more about what Jimmy did with some little pearl. And, and I didn't remember any of that. And I was sorry I didn't get more information, because that was a flawed memory for me. I just thought it was a carp and that was the end of the story. Um, I should have asked my siblings more questions, I guess. <laughs> but I think just, you know, I think maybe just in general too, looking back at that whole era of 1962 and how sort of sheltered and unaware I was of world outside of, <laughs> I mean, Sioux Falls, right? About as far as we went, except for summer we went on long trips, but. Yeah, just not knowing anything about race relations, not knowing anything about, I knew nothing about, nothing about Native American culture. And I grew up close to two reservations. I knew nothing about them. Even though my father hunted with a couple Native men and he spent time with them, I still knew nothing. And I, that's another thing I wonder, how could I not have known these things? How could I not have known? Why didn't I ask myself, why Indian children didn't swim with us in the public pool. Did I think they didn't want to swim? Why I didn't see Indian children at the movies? Why didn't I ever ask, where are they? I didn't. Oh, I'm really an awful person, I think maybe, but you know, I just, I didn't ask those questions for a long time. For a long time. So maybe it's so not so much faulty awesome. memory as, maybe it's not faulty memory as much as just not in ignorance, just not asking questions I should have been asking. Okay. Uh, so kind of, we're, I feel like you're almost getting into the territory of this. I think this is our final question. Yes, because okay. then I don't want to take up too much time so that we can make sure that everyone can get to their other sessions. But so our final question, um, this uh, viewer wants to know, I wonder how differently your story set in the past when it happened would differ if it happened today in our restrictive South Dakota environment. <laughs> I guess I'm just thinking sadly about the current need for social justice still elusive here. You know, 
one of the depressing things about this, when I started writing it, and I've worked on this book at least eight years, when I started writing it, it looked to me like things, you know, um, Marriage Equality Act was passed. People seemed to be getting to be more open. There was some legal, um, legal changes for gays and lesbians and bisexual and transgender people and for, and for people of color as well. And I remember thinking, I think I'm just writing about a story that doesn't exist anymore. I mean, this isn't a problem. So am I just, just kind of a, a book that will have no significance because these problems are all gone? Well, I think, of, I mean, what does, what was it now? The number of protests against people of color and the whole, you know, the whole thing with George Floyd up here in Minneapolis. Um, and the laws, the bathroom bills, the transcend, oh, you know, South Dakota, for instance, the whole issue of transgender girls playing on girls' teams and transgender bathrooms. It's just going backwards. And I find it so incredibly discouraging that it's it's like it's happening all over again. And I thought this was done. I thought we had a <laughs> handle on this. Um, I, I I love the state of South Dakota, but I just don't understand the political climate right now in terms of LBTGQ issues or Native American issues. I don't get it. Um, but anyway, I, I, I'm afraid it might be the same book, I guess, is my very short answer to, should have been my short answer, but it wasn't. But I think it'd be the same book. Okay. Ah, uh, let's see. Let me just double check to see if any of our Facebook viewers left us a comment. All right. And then is there anyone else here viewing us on Zoom with a question? Anything else for Mary before we go? All no, right, some please. thank yous popping in, some hand clapping. So yes, everyone on behalf of South Dakota Humanities Council, huge round of applause for Mary. Um, Thank, sharing, you. Thank you. Sharing her story oh, and her so expertise. My whole family's <laughs> on, I think. So oh, bye bye. <laughs> uh, everyone, don't forget to visit sdbookfestival.com/virtual for more great programming coming up today and the next few days next week. Take care. Thank you. Thanks, Jessica. Thank you. Bye bye.